Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, George Church. He's a professor of genetics at Blavatnik Institute of um, Harvard Medical School, director of Harvard Medical School, and HGRI Center of Excellence in Genomic Science and Personal Genome Project, Broad Institute, and with Harvard Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering. Thank you very much, George. Hello. It's good to see there's some people interested in the future. Uh, so this is my uh, conflict of interest slide. <laughs> and uh, and I know uh, some people uh, uh, say that I'm interested in transhumanism, which uh, I've neither confirmed nor denied. But I will say that we're already transhuman in the sense that we have all these incredible uh, differences between our ancestral limits and our current limits. We can basically see all the wavelengths of, of light that we could possibly want. We can uh, image them, uh, hearing, memory, all, everything has been uh, greatly augmented, uh, and we continue to push towards uh, theoretical limits, if any. Uh, so that's the starting point. I've, uh, these are a couple of books I've been involved in having to do with AI, which has come up already. Uh, but I'm going to make the argument that uh, uh, slightly contrarian to the normal uh, AI uh, discussion, um, that we're aiming for something that involves a heavy component of uh, biolog biological and hybrid uh, performance. And these are the eight reasons that I will, that, that I will give in advance. Uh, one is that biology is already ahead in terms of energy and size, and we'll have a slide on that in a moment. It's exponentially, it, it's going exponentially, and it's much faster than Moore's Law, up to six times. Uh, it's already good at atomically precise fabrication, so the, at, at where Moore's Law is kind of plateauing now, it's not atomically precise, and that's the obvious next step, and biology is already there. It's capable of rapid physical self-modification. Most of, even your most advanced chips are not changing the hardware uh, on a daily basis, on a, sometimes on an hourly basis. Um, when we... Uh, simulate a system, there are assumptions that are made, approximations, and typically it's a much bigger uh, problem, a bigger, uh, more costly to simulate than to actually compute. So in certain cases, you can actually do what's called natural computing, which is uh, more efficient, and that's essentially what uh, biology does. Um, here's something that isn't taught, uh, discussed much, but when we teach ethics, uh, you know, we worry about AI destroying us, but it's more a, a issue of ethics and, and uh, artificial stupidity uh, rather than artificial intelligence. And it's just very hard to teach uh, ethics, e even to humans, um, but I'd argue it's a little bit easier, maybe um, neurotypical humans, uh, probably current company included, uh, it is uh, the more atypical you become, the harder it is. And finally, it's easier to copy uh, a, a, a brain or an unknown than to translate it. So if the brain is unknown, to com completely understand it and translate it into completely different media is hard. So we do have these apparent victories of uh, chess, Jeopardy, Go, and so forth with uh, Watson and Google computers and so forth. But generally, we're talking about uh, 85 to 300,000 watts it's not quite a fair fight uh, competing with a 20-watt brain. Um, and that brain, by the way, is not focusing on the task. Typically, I think the, the players are thinking about uh, you know, their laundry and picking up kids and stuff like that. And when we talk about Go, that's, in a certain sense, it was an inhuman task. It was a task that humans weren't really evolved to do, digital, mathematic, computing. Um, we were uh, designed or, or evolved uh, to, uh, to do thinking out of the box, uh, mainly to escape uh, predators and get prey. Um, but you can have some person, uh, this plat patent clerk, uh, on, a, on a particularly good year, did five things that were probably uh, quite worthy uh, of, of uh, humanity. Um, and what if that were a regular person on a regular day, rather than an exceptional person in an, excep an exceptional year of his life? So that's, that's what these bell curves are. What if you take the outlier and tur turn it into the mean? And uh, I think 
uh, computers aren't anywhere near that. Some of this may or may not be heritable due to, by heritable I include environmental components, not just genetics. And here's a bunch of, these are all uh, family members that got Nobel Prizes, uh, pairs of family members. Computing efficiency, uh, it is true that there is a Moore's law and there's all these related laws that go exponentially and that we have come 19 orders of magnitude, uh, Max mentioned, but uh, biology is already up there. <laughs> it's way beyond the 19 orders of magnitude that we've done uh, in computing efficiency, for example, and also, uh, and we'll come in a moment in terms of uh, density of information storage as well. So I would argue that silicon could catch up if it kept going uh, in about three decades, but that's if biology stands still. And what do we think is the odds that biology is standing still? Well, this is what's not happening to biology, this is not standing still. It was going at Moore's Law when I started on it in the 70s, um, and, then so, and then it suddenly changed slope, and it's not even clear what, what's going to happen next, but it changed slope in uh, around 2004, I would argue, from molecular multiplexing. We, we basically, the reason we went so fast is we were drafting on, we were using ideas from, stolen from physics and chemistry and, and mainly the electronics industry. But adding multiplexing in 2004 made a huge difference and that's why we've had a 10 million fold improvement in the cost and the quality of reading and writing uh, nucleic acids. So this is just noting that Edison came up with multiplexing in 1874, got a patent for sending four signals on one wire by telegraph. Now this is a, a kind of multiplexing that we're doing in developmental biology. We're building brain components, two of the key brain components, but we've got dozens now uh, as the, the lining of the blood vessels and the neurons. Um, and you can get both of these from the same stem cells uh, uh, just by having different transcription factors, and Alex uh, M and, and uh, Peristu have put together a collection of all the transcription factors and can make lots of different cell types, and they interact and they make uh, very complex uh, brain-like structures that ha now have vasculature, finally, that allows us to get the bigger structures. Uh, and, and here's an example of an uh, axon A coming from a neuron, this is a cross-section, being myelinated, wrapped around uh, the way that the white matter uh, in your brain or the spinal column allows you to, to transmit uh, very high speed, higher speed uh, uh, neural uh, messages because it's jumping from node to node and it's demyelinating diseases like uh, uh, sclerosis, <coughs> multiple sclerosis. Uh, we have, we have recapitulated this now uh, outside the body uh, with these oligodendrocytes. We have uh, many of the components of, of the brain now. Uh, here they, they, they wrap uh, around another two cell types, both of them made um, actually from cells that derive from my arm. Uh, so these are fibroblasts to stem cells to, to neurons and glia and oligodendrocytes. And so there's a, there's a kind of a, 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 a uh, fun game we worry about in my lab is when there will be more uh, of my brain outside my skull than inside my skull. Uh, and you can make brain computer interfaces and these are, these are actually useful for about half dozen different human diseases already. Uh, you can have deep brain stimulation you can have a small number of electrodes, you can have little grid electrodes, but it's clearly quite, quite limited, very crude. Um, if, uh, and I think most people uh, who have these, if they were given a choice to being um, like the rest of us would probably pick it. There are higher uh, density uh, interfaces that we and others are interested in. Uh, we would like to be able to build reverse retinas so that we can, uh, just like you can have um, megapixel input in your retina, you should have megapixel output uh, that's telling you what a particular set of nerves is doing, and that's, uh, that's feasible. Here's, a, here's an example of a, of a, larva, of a zebrafish larvae, um, and you can see the, uh, the firing uh, real time. This is calcium uh, imaging. Ed may mention more of this sort of thing. 
But the point is that this is limited to microscopy, which itself is limited to, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of microns, uh, in, while, you know, the brain uh, is going to be much larger than that. So we need other ways of, of uh, interfacing uh, that are more compact, less energy consumptive, uh, and, and essentially uh, more uh, closer to natural biology than a microscope. One of the things that we've explored, and I can't say that this is necessarily uh, the be all and end all, but is, is storing information in DNA. And this has uh, a, uh, we can store, uh, this has now been uh, shown by a number of laboratories, not just uh, ours, uh, that you can, you can store um, uh, at, a, at about a million times higher density than most uh, electronic and optical storage media. And, uh, and this has been now used uh, by Microsoft and uh, Technicolor and others to store uh, videos. Started with that book. And here's one, that was, th those are typically, those videos are stored in, uh, in, in vitro, meaning outside of a living organism. But there's some that are done in living organisms. I'll give that example in the next slide. So here is a, a little movie that was uh, stored using part of the CRISPR system that's involved in storage, the one that most people don't talk about, which is Cas1 and 2. We've also used the part that people do talk about, but we've uh, uh, perverted it in a certain way so that it self-mutilates, uh, and that, that's Cas9, but this is Cas9 that's directed against itself. And that homing guide, um, Reza Kolhar, a postdoc in the lab, and Prashant Mali, who was one of the co-inventors of CRISPR, got back, to, he, he's now a uh, uh, professor at UCSD. Um, he came back, we, we collaborated to, to do this uh, where we can encode information in the mice during, while they're developing to say how it is that their um, uh, this one cell gives rise to another, gives rise to another. It can, re it can record in the cell what its uh, ancestry was, its cellular ancestry. And that's encoded in incredibly compact uh, using a tiny fraction of a percent of the volume of the, of the DNA, which itself is a tiny fraction of a percent of the volume of the, of the, of the organism. We estimate we, that, that Reza's mouse, each of his mouse, we have a mouse colony now that anybody can use for studying developmental biology, encodes about a trillion bits of information in this tiny amount of, of DNA stored throughout the organism. And we've used it to solve certain problems uh, already. Now, so we can squeeze uh, information storage into a very small space. We can store all of the internet exabytes of information in a, in a, in a few grams. Um, plus, we can expand the, the, the space as well. So there's, uh, th that's the human brain, the pathetic little bitty 1.3 kilogram human brain next to the a whale brain at nine kilograms. And this demonstrates that, that human beings can carry around a whole lot more uh, on, than nine kilograms. On, uh, they can carry around, uh, you know, 30 or 40 kilograms. So uh, there's really a lot of room to pack a lot of information in there. So many thousands of internets could be, could be stored um, in, a, something in, in our brains. So where do we stand in terms of making organs? Um, our best, our most advanced uh, efforts in, make, in building organs, uh, we, build, we, we build in pigs. Uh, and, and that's uh, an I old idea, 20 years old. Uh, and we just got involved because the pioneers who had thought, had hoped it would be a, a simple problem 20 years ago, discovered that not only were there more than one gene that needed to be altered, and changing more than one gene was quite daunting 20 years ago, or in fact, it was quite daunting five years ago. Um, and then they realized that there were um, maybe 100 genes that had to be changed, including a lot of viral genes that the FDA and others freaked out about. The idea that you would be taking pig organs where every cell of every pig in the whole world uh, releases these retroviruses, and retroviruses can cause cancer and so forth. Um, and that did not seem like a good idea for immune suppressed organ recipients. Um, it seemed like a possible evolved zoonotic diseases like HIV and 
uh, swine flu and Ebola. So wasn't really reassuring at the time. So we, we felt when we were invited to join this fund 20 years later and $2 billion later, I should, I should note, uh, we decided we should take that, that difficult task as, at first, and there were 62 retroviruses to knock out. And, we, and it was ridiculously easy, and that was, that was uh, uh, David mentioned uh, how, how much better our editing is, has become, and that was an example of that. So we went from kind of a record of doing two genes at once to doing 62 genes at once, and now we have uh, our new record is 15,000 uh, DNA changes at once. Anyway, we can, we can now, these are now is advanced enough that there are preclinical trials happening at, at MGH on uh, um, transplanting these pig organs uh, into primates and soon humans. Now, part of the thing I'm excited about the organs is not just making giant brains and, uh, and uh, solving the, the millions of people who need organ transplants, but uh, it's the possibility of having an enhanced organs. Now, making Enhancing human beings is, is, is uh, challenging ethically, and especially if you're going to grow the human specifically to be an organ donor. But if you're going to be growing the pig anyway, um, you, it's actually ethically demanded that you make that organ as good as it can be. If the, if the human needs uh, an organ because um, the, the current organ is being decimated by an infectious disease like hepatitis or something like that, you don't want the incoming organ to immediately get the same disease. So you'd like them to be pathogen resistant. We know how to make mice cancer and senescence resistance. Their, their, their lifespan has been extended by a factor of two with a very small number of genes, I should point out. Um, I already mentioned that for the immunity is something that has been solved uh, multiple times, involved multiple genes that, to do the, the pig transplants and also human universal CAR T cells, similar story. We'd like it to be able to do cryopreservation and radiation. Now those last two are nicely epitomized by some of these animals here, ranging from Arctic squirrels, uh, frogs, and these two at the bottom, the, the, uh, this midge um, and the tardigrade, which is already figured prominently in this uh, set of talks. But the midge is something that has been placed on the outside of the International Space Station, not on the inside, where it survived uh, very low temperatures, very uh, high desiccation and radiation for months, and then you just add a little drop of some water and then these things sprout back like they're happy, yeah. So that's, that's lidge, midge larvae, particular ones. So there's plenty of uh, place for us to go. We probably should, some of us should go as a backup. You know, nobody, hopefully none of you have this without a backup, right? Um, but right now, we're, we're sitting ducks for asteroids. Uh, and you know, even if we don't destroy ourselves, which I don't think we're going to do, but I think the asteroid will get us, or, or uh, the sun, or something. Um, so these are all the places that have, uh, and everything below the Earth has more water than the Earth. Uh, so there's lots of these, these moons that have more water than the Earth. There's plenty of water. And hydrogen's pretty, a pretty good premium, because on some of the planets, the hydrogen is just boiled off and is gone. So, um, what are we going to do? What are we going to take with us? So uh, it's, hopefully we're not going to take smallpox with us. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of pathogens I don't think it's necessary to bring. So we have to decide, um, you know, whales and, and trees, we could probably bring their DNA and decide later whether we want them or not. But I th hope, the, hope we, but the pathogens, we could even be germ-free. So that's what the point of this picture of David Vetter is is that he lived for 12 years in a germ-free environment. So it is possible, uh, as much as people get all excited about the human microbiome and microbiome products and so forth, uh, it's not required for life. Uh, but that's just our solar system. All those water-carrying uh, heavenly bodies were all within our solar system. But our solar system is a cynic duck, too. Um, it's going to get wiped out just as surely as Earth is. And so we have to back ourselves up even further out. And so how do we get uh, onto uh, Alpha Centauri and, and beyond? Uh, and there's this uh, breakthrough star, uh, <coughs> star shot, which is one of, the, uh, one of the ideas 
not of getting us there, of just of getting a one gram uh, camera to fly past at, at, at nearly uh, speed of light, you know, maybe tenth the speed of light or something like that, uh, maybe 20% light speed. Um, but there, there are a few uh, issues with this. What we really would like to do is uh, have uh, something at the other end so that we can, we've, we've already acknowledged in this uh, meeting that we can send information and most of, and information might be sufficient to encode us out there, but we need a printer at the other end. And so how do you get the printer at the other end? And this, this, this one gram package is just gonna do a flyby. We need the one gram to land and this is what happens when the one gram lands. Uh, it is on the order of several uh, Hiroshima bombs, uh, which if there's anybody there already, they might actually not consider this the most friendly introduction to our species, uh, is that this gigantic uh, thermonuclear weapon scale thing hits their atmosphere. Not to mention the fact that that probably would not be a good starting point for the our missionary to build a, a phone home uh, setup is if it blows itself up first thing. So anyway, so we're, um, we're thinking about ways of making, of scaling it down from one, one gram is already incredibly scaled down from any other satellite, but scaling it down to a nanogram. Turns out that there are very sophisticated cells that can, that from a single uh, cell can generate very complex uh, ecosystems. Um, so a nanogram is really quite a lot, uh, and it might be easier to slow down and land and, uh, and start building a very modest colony, just big enough so they can phone home and get instructions on what to do next, and maybe send a message of peace to the planet that it's on. Um, so that's what the idea here is, a nanogram. Um, and there are various components of the, you, know, you may think that a, that a living thing is not the best way to build a, a laser, um, which is what's been proposed for this break, breakthrough star shot is a, is a six watt laser working at 1550 nanometer infrared uh, communication channel. But we can, uh, biological systems make a, do a lot of inorganic engineering. Uh, so they, they build these magnetosomes and various magnetic uh, uh, structures that uh, measure the incredibly weak uh, Earth electro uh, uh, magnetic field. Um, there are these um, Venus baskets where you have two shrimp, male and female, that are locked inside of a, of a um, sponge, silicon dioxide, at the bottom of the ocean, very, very deep. Um, and, it's, and it's so dark in there that the only way that they can, they send out their um, progeny to go find the mate and, the, and the, this, has, this sponge cooperates with them, it's a it's symbiosis, by making optical fibers that are um, very close to human-made optical fibers and they have a, re, a refractive index gradient um, and it's presumably to l let the bioluminescence transmit uh, into the uh, deep ocean. And this is a this is a single cell that has a retina in it. So normally a retina is composed of millions of single cells. This is a single cell that has a retina. It has a, a lens, a cornea, and so forth. It just, I'm not proposing that this is what we want to send to Alpha Centauri, but it's just amazing what you can do with a nanogram. Period. Oh, questions? Thank George. We have one minute or so for questions. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll ask a, a quick one. With your sequential DNA, uh, your DNA storage, is it sequential only or can you get random access? I mean, you get a terabyte disk, you get a lot of data, and many terabytes, you can get it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. DNA, is it gonna take, you have to read the whole thing through a nanopore? Is it gonna take a long time or can you? I, I, I would, well, so the nanopore is highly parallel, first mm -hmm. of all. Um, I, I think that you, it hasn't been demonstrated, but it's not hard to imagine pretty good random access. But the, the whole interface back out yeah. of interfacing from biology to DNA back out to yeah. neurobiology, um, still a few. Many layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't fit in the margin yeah. of the talk. So yeah. you have a bit of time before it's in our head, but yeah. uh, we look forward to that. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think uh, we'll, we'll move on then to the, the next speaker. Let's thank George again. We'll talk more in the panel.